Welcome to our presentation for today. We are so delighted uh, to have you all here on this busy Saturday with so much going on. We really appreciate that you made this your choice for today. And we have an illustrious panel. Um, Mindy Todd, who is known by everyone here in our community, a celebrity, <laughs> true celebrity, who is the host of The Point on WCAI. She'll be chairing the panel. She'll introduce everyone, but I just wanted to welcome you. Uh, my name is Melissa Weidman, Director of Community Relations and Outreach for Hope Health. Our core service is Hope Hospice. We also have Hope Dimension Alzheimer's Services, Hope Care for Kids, uh, which Lindsay Coe here is our social worker, and the McCarthy Care Center. We have all kinds of materials in the back. Uh, please stay and um, ask questions. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end. Where is that? Well, I think we'll bring it in before the end. Before the end. <laughs> and um, we also want to thank Eight Cousins, who has come with copies of Russ's book uh, that he will sign for you at the end. And FCTV is filming this, just so you know. If you don't want to be filmed, you should probably just sit in the back and don't ask questions. <laughs> um, but it's wonderful they came because I think this is an important topic that the whole community will get to see uh, because it will be shown on FCTV. Okay, so thank you so much for coming, and Mindy, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. I don't know how close you have to be to these microphones. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I'm Indy, as Melissa said, Russ Lemke, who I think many of you in the audience know, the author of If I Could, I Would, an inspiring, inspiring story of a young girl who lived life to the fullest. You both have your copies in front of you. And of course, Lindsay Coe, who's the pediatric palliative service manager through Hope Health. Um, thank you. But we did a program um, on the point, was it a couple months ago now? Where we kind of talked about this thing. We thought, oh, Russ thought maybe this would be something the community at large might like to hear a little more about. So if you missed the program, um, we're going to sort of repeat much of it here today, but we want your input too. So um, we'll start out a little bit, but then as we go along, if you have questions, um, I think it's a small enough crowd that we can just kind of make it very conversational. So feel free to just kind of raise your hand if you have questions as we go, out, go throughout. Um, Russ, it's been 30 years since your 18-year-old daughter. That's died. correct. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about her so we can get a feel about her. A bit well, sure. Um, uh, Stephanie was 19 when she died. Uh, she was born in 1968. Uh, she had a congenital condition called bilateral retinoblastoma, which is a very, very rare cancer in the eyes. Do I need this? Yeah. Well, why don't you give me that one down there that's taller? Yeah, we'll switch. Okay. She had a very rare con uh, condition called re bilateral retinoblastoma, bilateral in two eyes, it's sometimes in one. And it, it, think of a mushroom with a cap on it. Well, this uh, tumor grows out of the back of the retina and comes out like a mushroom cap. So as it grows, it progressively uh, cuts down on the amount of vision that you have and ultimately you become blind. And she was blind at about nine or 10 weeks of, of her life. Um, and when it's bilateral, of course, it, it happens in both eyes. Um, and it's, it's very, very rare. Uh, it's one in about 30,000 to 50,000. That isn't even clear. Uh, and incidentally, interestingly, or I guess not interestingly, but understandably, the treatment I checked uh, on, online, the treatment for retinoblastoma today is no different than it was 49 years ago. Wow. Wow. But that's understandable because if, you're, if, if, if the medical profession is going to try to treat as many people as they can, they're going to go after lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate. So with one in 30,000, it's hard to justify as cruel as that may seem. So at any rate, uh, we were able to determine what it was. Uh, there's one place in the world that was, and I believe may still be, the center of treatment for all over the world. And when we went down to New York, there were people from various parts of the world there. And it was at the Eye Institute at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which at that time was on 168th Street on the west side of New York. Uh, the treatment in that case was to remove one eye and to treat the remaining eye with a radiation. Uh, they, the, uh, chemotherapy is also an option, but that wasn't that option. So it was treated with, uh, radiation, 
and uh, it retreated to the point that she didn't quite have distinct vision. She was legally blind, probably more than legally blind. But you might know the construction of the eye is such that there's a very small section, like a pinhead, at the, almost at the center of the, of the retina, uh, which uh, permits one to have distinct vision and see colors. Well, that was covered. So if you can imagine what she saw, you put your fist in front of your eye. And, and, and that's what she saw. She saw nothing except around the periphery. So she would have to move her eye from side to side to get an impression of what it was that she was looking at. And, uh, but happily, um, they were able to treat it to the point that she had uh, some amount of vision. She was able to go to school. She almost finished it through grade 12. Uh, she was active at horse riding and a number of other things that she loved. And, uh, and so that's the, the situation that we were faced with at the, at the start, Mindy. Yeah. And it was uh, six days from her diagnosis that you were going to be able to get in to see the specialist in New York. And you write in the book, in retrospect, I wonder if we should have simply presented ourselves in New York on Monday morning. At least we would have been doing something, doing nothing, and you're in for a terrible guilt trip. Yeah, guilt, the gift that keeps on going. <coughs> so talk right. about that guilt. Well, uh, the guilt has disappeared a bit. No, it's receded a bit. But uh, with a condition like this, of course, I think it's universal that cancer proceeds more rapidly in younger people than more elderly people, I believe. And of course, in her case, it was approaching so quickly. At six weeks, the pediatrician didn't even see it. At 10 weeks, she was blind. So if we had just gotten a car and gone to New York that afternoon, maybe we, maybe we could have saved some more of her vision. Who knows? But uh, with that condition, you want to jump on it rather quickly, and, and we didn't. So there's still guilt around. Lindsay, talk about that because I'm sure that's got to be a common theme among parents who have, you know, whether they're terminal or just chronically. What you think? What if? What if I had done this, or what if we had gone this route instead of that route? Um, and that guilt is very common. Exactly. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, guilt is very, very common, and kind of like Russ, you're, you're thrown into these situations very quickly. So oftentimes families, they have no medical background. They do not know anything about these illnesses that are, their children are going through. So they have to become experts in a disease that they never imagined that they'd have to deal with. So you can imagine what goes on in their minds as far as decisions that they have to make. You know what. What do I need to do in this situation? Because they don't know anything about it. And oftentimes, the, the conditions that are um, affecting children these days are not just um, cancers that we know about. They're congenital abnormalities. They're um, missing chromosomes. I mean, things that are so complex that you, know, you can't even pronounce the illness, let alone understand it. So to make families uh, make really crucial decisions for their own child is such pressure. And then they go back and think, was that the right choice? When really, it's just six to one, half dozen to another. I mean, which which do you choose? So um, I can fully appreciate the guilt that you've felt, Russ, because it's something that many, many families deal with. A little bit different now than, than when Russ went through this. There was no internet. There was, and now, you know, you would go on the internet and, you know, I, I know sometimes when I'm at my doctor, he says, I do not want you to go on the internet. <laughs> because you, you can see so many things that may be true, may not be true. Um, so talk a little bit, about, first, Russ, talk a little about that. DNA, there was no DNA testing back then. So you, your way of learning was what? Reading articles? And how did you educate yourself on, on what she, this disease was that she had? Well, actually, we got most of our education from the doctors in New York. Uh, we didn't know what we were up against, and as you say, Lindsay, you're faced with this thing and you can't even pronounce it. Uh, so we got most of our education from the doctors in New York. We did subsequently read as much as we could, not online in 1968, uh, but we found articles and information in the library and so on, and so we educated ourselves as much as we could. <clears throat> Uh, what we did find was that this is very, obviously, as I said, very rare, but it's both hereditary and random. And we didn't know which it was. Was this hereditary or random? There was no DNA testing to un unfold that for you. 
And so we just, we, we didn't know where we were, and, and there was, we could find no way to determine that. What about now, um, Lindsay, when families are, are dealing with this, whatever they can't pronounce, mm -hmm. um, do you consult them to learn as much as they can via internet? I don't, what do you, how do you tell people when they're trying to learn everything they can about whatever their child is suffering from? Um, well, we are fortunate to live in a very medically rich state. Massachusetts is one of the most, number one um, states as far as even um, children's hospitals. So, you know, oftentimes when a child has been diagnosed, they are working with children's or um, Mass General or perhaps Tufts. But each of those hospitals has something called a PAC team, which stands for Pediatric Advanced Care Team. And those are the experts um, with their child's illness. So they do a great job as far as educating the families about what is needed, what the trajectory of their this illness is. You know, I, I, I am a big proponent of um, you learn better by talking to people and looking at evidence-based research versus Wikipedia or WebMD. You know, but not everybody knows that. And, um, you know, there's so much, I have to say, junk out there on the internet. So I really refrain families from um, going there. And there's even a website called Courageous Parents Network uh, that unfortunately didn't exist two years ago. but. It is a free online resource that, not so much with education of a disease, but it's support for families who are going through this. Because there's so many unknowns, and they don't have time to go to a support group or a therapist to deal with the anxieties and the sadness that comes about with ch uh, their child's illness. But they need to feel support. So this um, network helps other families who are dealing with similar uh, issues and the, the myriad of dynamics that unfold with the family too. Support's key and, and Russ, in the book you write, um, you write that when you were at the Columbia Eye Institute you stayed with other families in a group home who were undergoing similar experiences and you found this connection with them very helpful. Talk very a bit therapeutic. about that. Yes, very therapeutic. It was before McDonald's had been uh, found the, Mc, the Ronald McDonald house but this was a, a a, a home, an apartment, a, a walk-up uh, near, near Columbia Presbyterian Hospital that these two doctors, who were wonderful doctors, uh, humanists really, uh, had purchased this brownstone and, uh, and they, they made it available for people who were dealing with exactly this condition, retinoblastoma. So we checked into the place, the price was right, I think like four dollars a day, and nothing if you couldn't afford that. And, uh, and we were around people who were dealing with the same conditions as we were. And so it was therapeutic and very, very helpful. Now every now and then you run into someone who's not exactly as helpful, so you have to be careful and, and not deal too much with those people. But, but in almost every case these people were beneficial and really a part of a very important and, uh, and helpful uh, uh, support group. Uh, after Stephanie's surgery, uh, she was cancer-free, but you knew she was going to have vision problems for the rest of her life. So talk about that transition as, as she becomes cancer-free and, and what kinds of supports she was going to need. Well, that was quite an experience. Um, we didn't know, for, we, we, didn't, we thought that she was blind, and she was blind, I think, for four, four or five months after the operation as the cancer receded. It never did fully recede. Of course, the one eye had been enucleated, so she only had vis any vision in one eye. And uh, the cancer receded almost to the side of her macula, but not quite. So she was still did not have distinct vision, and she was, as far as we could tell, at least legally blind, if not more. It seems to me at one point we had a calculation of 20 over 400 or something like that. And I, I'd have to go back in the book and remember exactly. Maybe it's not in the book. But at any rate, she was clearly uh, had limited vision. So we had to go through the process of determining what we should permit her to do, what we should not permit her to do. Uh, uh, not only going to school, which unfolded later, but do you let her go out and run in the yard? What happens if she falls down and, and a, something pierces her eye? She's, she's blind. And so that was uh, basically a, a trial basis where we had to determine uh, how much we were going to let this kid 
do, do in order to save her eyesight, some whatever eyesight she had, as compared to limiting her to the point of, of being quite constrained. And her personality, I can tell you, would have been quite different if we had done, if, if, for those who've read the book, her personality was not that. And so for what it was worth, we went through that process and decided that to, wherever we could, we'd take a chance. And that went on to her later years when she did a number of things that she probably shouldn't have done. <laughs> Leslie, talk about that too. When you have a child who has some sort of injury or is, is terminal, you, you have this tendency to want to protect them and, and keep them safe. You don't, you know, they're, they're not like their peers and you worry about them being bullied or being accepted. And like Chris says, can they go play here? Can they participate in this particular sport? That's a really tough situation for a parent to be in, not knowing what's really what's best for the child. Exactly. And, you know, as the case with, with Stephanie, um, a lot of children who battle these diseases, it's for a long period of time. It's very rare that it's in a very acute situation where they would isolate the child and say, okay, temporarily, you're not going to go outside and play. They're dealing with this for many, many years. So how do you construct a childhood for somebody um, that is helping safeguard them, but yet letting them be a child? You know, I have a thinking of one family right now in our service that um, he's very susceptible to pneumonia and but he loves to swim so mom is constantly dealing with that you know how to let him be a child and enjoy something that he absolutely loves to do but yet she knows how susceptible he is to aspirating on water so it's a constant tug of war and it is a risk but you know it's a little bit of a leap of faith you know just to um, balance the, the, the load really of what that what that's like for a child to give them happiness but yet protecting them it's, it's do you find in most cases like with this um, mom who has a son who likes to swim as long as you are understanding the risk and you're monitoring that that it usually turns out to be okay absolutely you know and I, I think that the more and more you unfortunately have to deal with this is that you learn the symptoms of your child probably even more than a physician does so she knows exactly what he looks like when he's gotten too much water you know he turns a certain color stuff that maybe even doctors don't know but you know parents become so attuned almost symbiotic with their with their child because they're dealing with it so much so Yes, it's a little bit of a risk, but as long as you kind of know, okay, this is what I got to do if I see my child turn this color or whatever it is, and this is the protocol. Well, there, was a, there was a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Just a, a time-frame question. Once you said it, you did, this was diagnosed when she was very young, an infant, right? Six yeah. weeks, seven weeks of age. Right. Um, which I imagine is hard to determine because the child can't speak or tell you the problem. Um, and how many surgeries did she have? When was the first? How many surgeries did you yeah. have? Well, I'll, I'll go through the first set. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that hard to diagnose. I, I don't want to put guilt on the uh, on a pediatrician, but we saw in her eyes uh, at about seven weeks, maybe even less, because we could see the tumor growing in her eye. It was like a reflection, it was white, and I thought that I was seeing a reflection of the light or something in her eye. So, so it is not that hard to diagnose. A visual examination will diagnose it. She had, at that time, at that point in her life, she had one operation. She had this eye enucleated, and then she had, which is taken out, and, and then she had radiation on the other eye. And that was the extent of the operations for the next 14 years of her life. We're getting to the next part. <laughs> All right. And there are lots. So let's talk about her, her quest to become this equestrian. She loved horses. So talk about how that came about. Well, we, we, uh, we I, I've lived in both countries. I'm an American, American citizen and a Canadian citizen in case things get really bad. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know what my wife will do. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, we were living in Toronto, and there's this beautiful area north of Toronto, Lake Simcoe, and that's horse country, and so we were up uh, for, for, uh, this, for a vacation, and she saw this horse, and she said, I want to steer it, and that's where it started, and, uh, and she loved that, and so that was the start of it, and, uh, but she didn't take it, we weren't in a position to take it up again, 
uh, well, we, there were a few opportunities with horses, but it, there aren't that many horses in downtown Toronto. Uh, so when we moved to New Jersey, there was a uh, stable in Summit, New Jersey, that was a stable, Watchung Stables, some of you may know it. And so Stephanie rode at Watchung Stables until we moved back to upstate New York, and then she got her own horse. But she just loved it. And the interesting thing is, she was about that tall. And these horses like her, seemed like they're about 17 hands. These things were huge. And she would walk in between these horses, and I would just fear for the fact that those horses were going to disagree with one another and crunch her. Uh, but she would walk fearlessly among those horses and somehow climb up on the horse or somebody helped her. She was just a little bitty thing. Normal, normal size, but she was pretty young. And, uh, but she had no fear of those horses, and, and somehow I think a horse seems to know. I had a horse. The horse knew she was there. They knew she was there. Yeah. Particularly with girls. There's something about girls and horses that is so beautiful. Yeah. So talk about the riding girl. That was a that was sort of a therapy for her, wasn't it? Oh yeah, very much. She she it obviously anybody with this condition lacks self confidence and has to be reinforced constantly. And this was an opportunity to reinforce her. The cover of the book will show no end of ribbons that she won. And she had them strung in a V-shape uh, on her room. And, and that was helpful to her because it gave her the self-confidence that she could do it. When you're, when you're doing an equestrian event and there's a track that you have to, a course you have to follow around, we knew that she couldn't possibly see that course. How could you, when 2400 vision, but at the start, somebody would, would run, run in front of her and show her where to go. But after a while, you could see her pointing her, her crop, which she never used a crop in a horse. She would point her crop and get it inside her head where to go, and then somehow be able to figure that out. So that was therapeutic for her. It was a confidence builder, and, and it resulted in her doing quite well. And then um, the cancer returns, and it manifests itself in her leg. And the doctors say, she should stop riding. Oh, she didn't. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. She was like, and you know how important that was to her. That must have been a really tough time for your wife. The doctors are saying she shouldn't ride. She's saying, yeah, I'm going to ride. And you're like, what do we do? Well, what it was, when, when, when she had the, the cancer, by the way, retinoblastoma in a certain number of cases, not all, in a certain number of cases, reoccurs in the opposite leg in the second decade. Now, the good news is not always. Some of you may remember Peter Falk, Columbo. You remember how his eyes yeah. just pointed? Peter, Colum uh, uh, Peter Falk, Columbo, had retinoblastoma as a kid, and he went through exactly what she went through. One eye nucleated and the other was radiated. And so it doesn't always happen, but in this case it did happen. And so the treatment was to, uh, uh, they were able to save one leg. They, 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 they removed the, the, the course of treatment, removed the, the cancer, and then they gave her a, a replacement knee, which at that time was a little bit of a breakthrough. And of course there was, there was a, a glue that held the, the knee together. The, the, down in the, the tibia, this spike went into the tibia and they cemented it in. And the doctor said, well, I said, what are her limitations? And he ran off all the limitations and I said, well, she rides. And he said, well, she must not ride. Well, I don't think, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Neither of us. And so she rode. Good. How many surgeries did she end up having on that leg? Do you know? Do you remember? Boy. A lot. A lot. Let me read one thing to you. Just sure. like, I got to find this. Just a minute. Um, here we go. Uh, Good things, come to, good things come to those who wait. Worse yet, I've got to go back and surge her in February. My stupid leg got too loose, loose, and they're going to take the bottom part up and replace it. I feel like a goddamn car. <laughs> oh well, life times a suck at times. And uh, that was one, I think there were, I think there were three operations on her, I think the third. The first one, she, they, it was too short. The, th this was, this was state of the art at that time. Uh, there weren't that many knee operations going on. And so the first one, they, 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 the leg was a little too short, an inch or too short, and that wasn't good enough for her, so she went back in and had another operation, and it was still a little bit too short. 
but it was better. And then, of course, riding the horse, I think, probably caused the cement to loosen it, so she had a third operation on the lake. Talk about her attitude. You just read that little bit there about she, she was quite some young lady. She was very determined. She had a great sense of humor. Talk about her attitude facing this. this. Well, Mindy, I'll read a couple of things here. Um, but she was a, I guess we did some some part of a good job. I'll see if I can, it's going to take me a minute to find now, it While here. you're finding it, Lindsay, talk about programs. Now we have a lot of counseling programs for the kids who are going through this, so talk a little bit about what's available. Right, and going back to what I originally said, we are very fortunate to live in a state um, that's very medically rich, and um, the Department of Health through Massachusetts has a grant um, for all pediatric palliative care programs, and they are connected to hospice agencies. There's about eight in the state, and one is um, our hospice, Hope Hospice, has um, what we call PDPAL program, that's a nickname for it, and we provide um, services to families uh, working with children who have life-limiting illnesses, and that is a broad range of services from complementary therapies, nursing, social work, um, anywhere, anything from helping a child have um, you know, more relaxed benefit with like massage, for example, if they're dealing with a lot of plasticity, with dealing with their illness, to the more psychosocial components. Um, child life specialists, they help uh, children and families, including the siblings, because siblings deal with a lot too, dealing with the anxiety and um, sadness and competing for attention. Um, child life specialists work with both patient and siblings um, to deal with the complexities working in a healthcare system, um, anxieties that come up from having frequent hospitalized, hospitalizations to MRIs, CAT, CAT scans, you name it. So this program really encompasses the spiritual, emotional, physical needs of families uh, dealing with the, their illness. How do you think they let the children's health insurance uh, uh, program lapse? Is that going to affect care for children with chronic illnesses and illnesses? Well, fortunately, our program is, uh, we don't charge anything. It's a free program. So um, up until the child is 19 years old, uh, this grant pays for all these services. So that's a fortunate thing, again, that we have in Massachusetts. So we don't charge um, any insurance to deal with, uh, to be on our program. Russ, did you want to read a couple passages? Well, this is both before her second bout of cancer and after, and, and uh, to give you an idea, Mary, her best friend, Mary won't, won't tell me what she's going to get me for Christmas. She did tell me it's blonde, but it's a rectangle and on TV. I said hers was a rectangle, but it could be a circle. She asked if it was flat, and I told her it would be if you sat on it. <laughs> on Thursday, Mac puked in the garbage can of biology, gross. Well, time for lunch. Bye. <laughs> And here's in the hospital. This she's in the hospital. At this point, she was in the adult section because she was of an age she, she could no longer be in the, in the kids section. Just because one is aged, aged, does not necessarily relate to them being deaf. The staff likes to make very sure the patient, as well as everyone else who's not sleeping, hears them. So if you were sleeping, well, if you are sleeping, well, you wear. <laughs> and there's lots more like that. Uh, Stephanie has a younger sister. Yes. So ta and, and Lindsay just sort of touched on that, that this, this oftentimes impacts the siblings and that they're like, well, wait, what about me? And, you know, you're focusing a lot of attention on, on Stephanie who needs, you know, special attention. And then you also have to think about the needs of your other daughter. Uh, talk about that relationship and, and that complication. Well, boy, that's a tough balancing act. We have two kids. I have one child remaining. She's now 43. Um, and I don't know what the answer is because you're trying to help the ill child stay as well as they can get better hopefully and then as they're dying what, how are you going to handle that? And the other one is perfectly healthy. There was some resentment between with the older child. Stephanie had some resentment toward her sister who had perfect vision so there was friction there. And, um, and to try to balance the care of one and taking care of the other is very difficult. There were times when our younger daughter was, 
she was just left with friends and, and, and neighbors as much as we could because we felt the need and the obligation to take care of the older one. I don't know what the answer is, but we sure could have used some help in that area because we were, frankly, we were winging it. Lindsay, a lot of parents are winging it. Absolutely. Yeah, and oftentimes there's more than one sibling. And so, I mean, that's part of our services is that, you know, we have these child life specialists that um, actually work just solely with the siblings. Sometimes that can help families or parents because they feel better about, okay, their child, their other child can have a, a service provider. You know, their, their sick child is obviously going to the hospital a lot and getting a lot of attention. And sometimes they're getting great attention, the attention they need. I mean, we have a, one child who's been, he's in and out of the hospital all the time and he comes home with more toys, teddy bears, blankets that you can imagine, and then it's left, you know, the, the sibling, like, what about me? So. I think because that has become such a big issue with these families that there are more and more resources out there between um, counseling services, complementary therapies, um, but as far as managing it from a parent's standpoint, it is very difficult because you can't have any regret. You can't think, okay, I have to pay attention to um, my other child because you know that if you don't 110% take care of your sick child, it could mean life or death in some cases. So it is very, very difficult. So a lot of times I'm just sitting there validating the parents that this is, it's okay that you're struggling with this. This is very real and, but allow us to help you with the sibling support because it, it really does take a village. And Stephanie, like, and she was not a difficult child, but like any teenager, she had her moments where she'd be a little bit surly, right? Oh, <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> and um, disrespectful, maybe, perhaps, sometimes. So were you apprehensive about disciplining her at, at, given the difficult time that she was going through? Did you kind of just go, all right, you know, uh, man, normally I would do this, but... Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was uh, the soft one. Um, and uh, at one point, uh, that's maybe hard to believe, at one, at one point, uh, that laugh wasn't necessary. <laughs> at, at one point, she, she became belligerent. At one point later in her life, she became belligerent. And my feeling was, let the kid have her belligerence. She's dying. And so we actually, in this case, we found a hospice care. One time, this was in a part of the world, and at a time, a place in time, when there was very little help. It was, it, I won't say remote, but it certainly wasn't downtown Boston, and or Cape Cod, and uh, and so we didn't know where to turn. And and I felt that she, we should just let her have her own way. And her mother said, No, we, there's got to be, there have to be boundaries. So she called someone, I forget who it was, and that person confirmed with her, you just have to have boundaries. So that was one time it was clear, but I must say other than that, there were times she aggravated me, you know. She was 15 and I was stupid. Uh, and so there was that, this aggravation, but nothing like her, her, her younger sister should have a master's in aggravation. <laughs> You write in the book uh, that, uh, in addition to being tough, Stephanie was a straight shooter. She wanted uh, t t you, she wanted her doctors, you, everybody to tell her the realities, what was happening, what was the cancer treatment, uh, and, and you talk about the honesty and, and the communication that you have with her during this time. Well, uh, uh, our education happened rather quickly. I'll, I'll, re I'll read two passages uh, as soon as I find it here. Uh, she had, she, so we took her to New York, who was diagnosed as, as uh, osteogenic sarcoma, nativia. And, uh, and so we took her to New York and we met with these doctors. We, again, we hardly even knew what was going on. It was happening so fast. This is Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. Sloan Kettering Hospital is in the business of treating cancer. And, uh, and so we, were, we weren't even sure what we were doing. I felt like we were in a whirlwind. And so here's what happened. At first, I thought the chemo, this, they said chemotherapy. At first, I thought the chemo would, a chemo would kill the tumor, then I would go home. That's why I was taking it. When doc, Dr. Marco said, we're going to save this leg, I didn't quite get it. Brilliant to not tell me. So we weren't being upfront with her. 
Uh, and and uh, so then we, we found rather quickly that the, the way to treat her was with honesty. And then at the end of her life, we realized that we couldn't keep going back and forth to Sloan Kettering. She was in the last phases of her life. We recognized we had to somehow get closer to home. And so we went to this one doctor, I'll, I'll, I'll call his name Con, not quite correct, but in case he's still around. And, uh, and, and she wanted to know how long she had to live. And so at one visit, she asked the doctor point blank how much time she had left. He responded vaguely, so she pushed for an answer. He finally said, Stephanie, I don't know how to talk to you. You are too direct for me. When we left, she said, his name is Dr. Constink. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, another Dr. Emmons. I'll tell you, this guy was great. The doc, that doctor said I was too frank. He couldn't talk to me. He's got, what's he got about Frank? Why am I hard to talk to? Mom says I took it wrong. I want straight answers, honesty, no secrets. When, do, when Dr. Emmons, I, I like Dr. Dr. Emmons, he's gnarly. This doctor on the other side of the galaxy is not, galaxy is not, makes me mad, acts like he doesn't know. So she desperately needed to know what was going on, and it would, took us a little while to understand that. Hi, Lindsay, is that common? Kids want to know? It is, but it's also common that kids don't want to know. And it's not to say that they aren't aware of what's going on, but there's also so much that they can handle it at a time. So the approach to have with kids, no matter what, is that always ask them what they want to know. Let them control uh, the situation. They're, they lack such control in their lives at, when they're dealing with a chronic illness that Everything is about empowering them to let them dictate what it is that they want to know, what they don't want to know, and this, just constantly asking them questions. Are you, do you have any questions? Um, do you want to talk about this? Is there anything you want to discuss with the doctor at this time? Anything that can give them the, the power and control to facilitate a conversation, but also not forcing it, too, because kids may be aware, but they don't necessarily want to talk about it. They want to focus on playing. They want to focus on a video game or watching TV and just living life. Couple of treatment. Mindy, that, that was one of the uh, teachings that Stephanie got to us. Uh, because because of her honesty, we, we finally figured out what she, how she wanted to handle this. Her younger sister, on the other hand, we sensed wanted to have wanted to be given the information when she asked. Mm -hmm. And so we were careful with her. And uh, I remember at one point she said, is Stephanie going to die? And I said, well, she may. And then that seemed to be enough for her at that time. So that was one of the learnings that, that, that we got out of this. I was thinking that question is like when somebody goes to you and says, am I going to die? How do you answer that? Oftentimes, and not to say this is the key or answer to every scenario, but part of them knows that they're going to die if they're asking that question. So I will put the question back on them. What do you think? What do you think is happening? And it, because a lot of times they're asking it because they want to talk about it. They don't need, necessarily need that yes or no, but they just need to have the, the safety of being able to discuss it in that moment. So is it a yes or no question? Not necessarily, but it's more about- well, I like the Russ's answer, she may. Yeah, that's not saying yes, not saying no. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. What about treatment? Um, some kids want to have some input in their treatment. Other kids may may not. I guess it's age appropriate, right? I mean, it's, Help me. as as you know, Russ, sometimes children who go through these things they um, accelerate at development very quickly, and they become very mature, old souls. Some people will call them because. They fast forward, they're growing up so quickly. And so what ends up happening with that is that they become very mature for their age, including with decision making and being aware of the healthcare system and um, what to do. So, I mean, I'm very big into empowering children in making decisions. And so, yes, there are times where families do have to make decision, decisions for them because not every child who has a life-threatening illness is um, able to speak or hear or see or have um, complete cognition. So some families are constantly making decisions for them, no matter what. 
So that is a heavy load for families because no matter what, they can't put the question on them of what do you want to do. It's they they have to decide. That can be difficult. Yes, ma'am. I think of Perkins School for the Blind here and resources that we have, and I wonder, did you consider having her go to a, a school for the blind if there was one available, maybe be a resident? I mean, you sound like a very close, loving family, so I wouldn't think necessarily, but so that she would have peers, maybe more resources. Did you consider something? We did. Um, not in Toronto. When we lived in the Toronto has had, and I'm sure still has, a superb system to handle situations like this. And they were, she was mainstream. New Jersey, we lived in some New Jersey after that. It wasn't quite as good. And we, we reached the point that we wondered about her going. There's a school for the blind in Morristown, or there was in Morristown. And we considered having her go to that school for the blind. Um, we decided, for better or for worse, we decided against it because we didn't feel that she, she, she did have vision. She was able to, she was ambulatory in every sense. She could ride her bike, all those kinds of things. So we felt that we may be limiting her progress by doing that. Somebody else would have to tell me whether we were made the right decision or not, but we certainly did consider that. Did she read Braille or recording? How did she learn to get information and knowledge? Well, she uh, she was able to read. In fact, if you read in the book, and she she was an excellent. I don't know how she did it. In fact, I emailed my former wife a couple weeks ago and asked her, "Do you think because of the chemotherapy on her knee, she had loads of chemotherapy, whether or not that?" Be, be, uh, let me back up. The retinoblastoma in her eye had not fully calcified. It was dormant, but not fully calcified. I got the sense that her vision may have actually improved in the last phases of her life. You know, I don't know. Uh, in, in answer to what she was able to do and not able to do, she was able to read somewhat. Uh, if, if one put a, uh, a foil on top, a yellow foil on top of the words. She could read them better than if it was white paper. She had friends uh, transcribe for her. She always sat at the front of the, of the room, which she hated. She sat at the front of the room. Others would take notes for her. Her mother worked tirelessly transcribing for her when she got home, and so on. So she got by in that way. And by the way, she was an outstanding artist. If you get the book, she had some pretty neat stuff in there. So, so at any rate, uh, that's what she was able to do. But she never, she, I, I'm not so sure she would have accepted Braille. We might have made her a little bit too stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to talk about a real, a real highlight. We know, Make-A-Wish Foundation grants wishes to terminally ill children. And you know, after all they go through, you know, sometimes the families, it's just a great little respite escape. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie had a pretty amazing experience Russ, tell us about that with you, too. Oh, well, um, <laughs> everybody has their famous artist, right? It was Neil Diamond at the start until I decided I like Neil Diamond, and then he <laughs> fell out of favor. <laughs> <laughs> so then she went to, she got into U2 before U2 was U2, and she just loved their music. And of course, they have a, they have a moral message, and she, she was all into that kind of thing, thank goodness. And, uh, and so before her, her second last very significant operation, I was trying to think of something we could do and uh, to get her to, uh, to meet you too because they really would have liked this. So, so I made contact. I I'd, I'd met a, a chair of the Irish Gas Board. He lived in Cork at the time. I had met him at a certain educational thing I was going to. And I also had some contacts in the entertainment industry in New York and through one, I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden I got a call from U2, uh, from their agent, and we went over, to, went over to Dublin and spent the afternoon with them. Ironically, that was just at the time when they were getting ready to release the Joshua Tree. 
this, I don't know how many of you are U2, how many, is U2? How many are U2 fans? Oh, wow, <laughs> me too. <laughs> and, and they are now doing the 30th anniversary of Joshua Tree. So they were doing Joshua Tree when we were there, and when I finish the book 30 years later, they're doing Joshua Tree around the states of North America and South America. So anyway, we made the connection. It really worked well, and about a few months later, uh, they called and said they wanted to see her again. So we went down to Fluido El Paso. I wasn't sure she could make the trip because she was really having difficulty. Uh, but we made the trip, went to Fluido El Paso, drove up to Las Cruces, New Mexico. And, sp and she spent an hour or so with you two. Time Magazine was sitting outside and she spent about an hour with you two. It was really a, a wonderful experience and made a lot more out of her life. I, the, the dying part is really, I mean, what that's a parent's worst nightmare, to have to watch their child die. And everybody deals with that in a different way. Um, and Russ, when I start with you, how did your family deal with that? I mean, some people, you know, they turn to their religious or their spiritual, or they, they find comfort in their friends. I mean, everybody has a different way of dealing with that. How did you cope with that? Well, this may sound rather strange, but we had time. Uh, I've met a person recently who's agonizing over the death of their daughter, who's about the same age as Stephanie was, I think, and uh, and they're they're having a very they're having a more difficult time than I did, I think, and ironically, we had the grace of time to know what was coming. In the last year or so of her life, we I felt like we were being sucked down a funnel. And so I think the grace of time helped us, and friends. We had some wonderful, wonderful, deep friends. And Stephanie did become spiritual. And so the combination of those, uh, I think, got us through. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I have any specific formula as to what people would do or not do. Well, I, I want to say one thing. She was a big fan of the movie All of Me. And there's a great story that goes with this. Talk about that. Well, um, yeah, how, I don't know how many remember the movie All of Me. It was one of the best cast movies I've ever seen with Lily Tomlin and uh, Steve Martin. And so I'll have to set the stage for those who haven't seen it. Lily Tomlin is dying, and she has a swami there who's about to catch her spirit in a beautifully finished brass of copper bowl. And he catches her spirit just as she dies. And Stephanie loved this catches her spirit just as she dies. And he's going over to put it somewhere, and the, t the, 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 the window is open. It's a double hung. The window is open. Steve Martin is down below. He trips. And the spirit goes out and lands in Steve Martin's body. So Lily Tomlin lives in Steve Martin's body. I want, can you imagine the scenes? But at any rate, uh, the thing that she liked as much as anything, when Lily Tomlin was lying in beautiful repose with her hair flowing to the sides, and they said, well, what would you like at your funeral? And she said, she said I would like goose pâté to be served. <laughs> so Stephanie had us put out goose pâté. <laughs> so there was this goose pâté at our reception, and people came up and they said, excuse me, but what is that? And nobody ate it, but she wanted that. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, maybe you can talk a little bit about how families get through that grief. Right, and, and I completely agree with Russ. There is a grace with time when you know when it's happening and you do have time. It certainly does not take away the pain um, when it eventually does happen, but it can um, release some of the intensity of it. Um, but when we have families on our service, you know, we, we help them through that process of anticipatory grieving, you know, where um, from the logistical pieces, helping funeral planning to advanced care directives, there's something called Voicing My Choices out there, which is a wonderful um, pamphlet. It's kind of like um, my, my, I think it's called Five Wishes, where hospice patients, they say what they want in their um, end of life. That way it helps them clearly state, this is how I want things to be. And it's the same thing with a child, that it's very painful and it's very hard for families to go there, but it can be really helpful um, making sure that the child has everything that they want 
towards the end and how they want their, their passing to look. And that can help a lot with the grieving process afterwards. And there are many resources out there um, for families with grief support, including for the siblings, uh, because it obviously, as we all know, I'm sure everybody in this room has lost somebody, that it affects us all differently. And you know, we all grieve differently, and what we need, whether it's a support group or individual therapists or just reading pamphlets or books about it, it's that's what we do. Is as a program is meeting them before the, the passing and after. It's just as crucial. So some people come in as, as we were talking, so we're, we're asking questions as we go along, so feel free to raise your hand. Just like you want, right over here. Um, I'm just curious as a, when it, it's so unimaginable to have a child die. Um, so as a friend or loved one, what is most comforting to the person. That's a I think people say really inappropriate things, and, and they don't mean to. But I think it's kind of extraordinary sometimes what people say. And I, I, as I said, I think they do it because they don't really know what to say. But so what are the kinds of words? I mean, I'm here for you. I love you. If you ever want to talk about, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't mean to be so pedantic about this, but one really doesn't sometimes know how to respond. Exactly. And believe me, it, it, your, your thoughts are very common, you know, where you, you want to do the right thing, you don't want to say the wrong thing, and you don't want to overdo, you don't want to underdo. Um, I, I'm a big fan of just avoiding platitudes, you know, the, the whole, um, a lot of times um, I talked to one mom, she said, if I hear one more person say I'm sorry, I'm going to scream, because, you know, why, what are you sorry for? You know, it, it, Again, it all comes from a wonderful place. I mean, we all just, we're, our hearts are bleeding for, for people, but what is it that that person needs? And I, I look forward to hearing Russ's response because I don't think anybody knows better than a parent who has lost a child as far as what they need. But back to what you were saying, I'm here, but when you need me, simple check-ins once in a while. Um, I'm a big believer in months and months later checking in because we all want to comfort people in the first few weeks, maybe even the first month, but it's the, the year later, or it's the not even the anniversary or the birthday, or think something that you expect the person to be in a lot of pain, but just that random six and a half week mark. Something that has nothing to do with an anniversary or a certain date, but just checking in, because that's when they need you most, is the in-between times where they feel like everybody has kind of forgotten about them or, you know, because that's, that's the big thing is people think, well, you're here right now because everybody's on board and you want to give me flowers and food and everything, but I could use you in, you know, an X amount of random time. That's when I really need your support. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't know that there's any one answer. I, I agree that uh, th certain things that certainly would have, wouldn't have helped me, like God took her, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, I think that just being there and being able, not just at that point, but maybe four to six weeks later, a couple months later, because what happens is you get these cards and the cards come in and everybody's sorry, don't be sorry, it happened. Uh, but just being around later, a few months, or go golfing, whatever you do, go out to a movie, go out to dinner, those kinds of things are very helpful. Just, I'd say, being there. Other questions at this point? I, I will add this, just a second, I will add this, that uh, I wish that we had had the support of Hope Hospice at that time, because this is, you have wonderful programs. And I think, I don't know if it's a combination of distance or time or time or whatever it is, but you're to be congratulated for the services you provide. I think we all agree on that. Go ahead, sir. I have two questions for you, Russ. First one is, do you go horseback riding? Do you go horseback riding? Uh, I used to. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I, I, I actually never, I, I didn't even go riding with Stephanie. That was, I didn't want to get in her way there, I did, the way I did with Neil Diamond. <laughs> so no, I, I haven't, I, I do not ride. I, I had a horse as a kid, and I understand the love of horses. A horse used to lie down so I could get on its back when I was that tall. So, I know about that feeling, but no, I don't, and I didn't. Okay, the second question is, uh, 
about Neil Diamond. As your uh, taste in music switched from Neil Diamond to you to uh, Bono, or <laughs> as it included both, or how did this affect your taste in music? How did it affect your taste in music? Well, I, I have to tell a couple of stories. I, I, I took Stephanie to some concert. I took her with to uh, this group in, Con in Rochester. I can't. They were. Filthy. I don't remember their name. But anyway, a Twisted Sister. <laughs> Twisted Sister. And, and, uh, so I, and I took her to a Yes concert. I love Yes. I love Brian Adams. Yeah, I think, I think my, my mood has changed a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story when we were uh, in Rochester at Twisted Sister. Uh, first of all, we came in and they ushered us. I was trying to get Stephanie to the front so she could at least see, but they was all filled up. So they took me and said, come right up front with us. They thought that I was the press because nobody <laughs> my age was. And, and so halfway through the concert, this person walking around saying, do you have a, uh, do you have a rapper for this? And he was looking for a rapper for marijuana. I oh. said, so, do you have any rappers? Do you have any rappers? And he came to me, started, he said, oh, no, you wouldn't have any. <laughs> so going to these rock concerts was quite an experience. But yeah, I think my, my taste has changed. Not to rap, but to others, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, the process of writing the book. You, you were going through Stephanie's journal, which I imagine had to be um, emotional on a number of fronts. Emotional kind of reliving living that, but also um, remembering her in a fond way, and all of you know the, the, the sweet sense of humor and the, the funny things that she would say. So talk about that process, what that was like for you. Well, it was cathartic, <coughs> and, and it's interesting that it took me a long, long time to finally write this, but I think a couple of years ago, Stephanie must have said, get off your butt, uh, because it was only two years ago that I really felt that this must be done. So I found it cathartic, it was sad, obviously, but for me it was educational, and I think the one thing that I got out of this more than anything else is your kids are a lot more mature than you ever give them credit for. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of things figured out that I never realized she had figured out. She had some things figured out that I didn't have figured out, and probably part of it was because of the rapidity of her maturity. I mean, she saw the end of her life coming, and. Uh, Maybe, I don't, I don't know if that has an impact, but whatever it was, she matured rather rapidly, perhaps in part because she was dealing with, with a tough situation, tough situations all of her life. So I think my, it was cathartic for me to do this. I, I, I loved learning more about her. How many have read their kids' letters? I never read anything she was writing. I would read beautiful essays that she wrote for, she's a very good writer beautiful essays that she wrote for school, but I didn't read her memos or her letters to friends or so on. And, and so that was educational for me to learn more about her and, and also to understand just how much you should listen to your kids and you should pay attention and just how mature they really are. That is the biggest take of this book. Linda, I want to ask you about that because sometimes um, I just, in my own experience, and thinking of many telethons I've done in my past, and, and knowing some of the kids who represent whatever um, disease or disability, and I'm always struck by this, what Russ is talking about, this sense of maturity. They seem so much much uh, wiser than, than their years, um, and, and so accepting, too, of whatever medical procedures they have to go through. You know, you have a normal tendency, like, no, I don't want to get a shot, and here will be a kid going in for some major operation who is... Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready for the next one. Right. And, you know, it, I wonder the same thing. You know, is it, is it the disease that makes them mature because of what they've had to go through? Or was it just something that they were born these old souls, so to mm. speak? It, it's, it, you really don't know. But I, I do know for sure that even the siblings, um, you know, family members, they, you really do grow up quickly with, um, when you're threatened with your life because there's nothing more um, real than when you are contemplating your life or it's flashing before you. So, uh, you know, I do think that just what you have to deal with going to the hospitals and surgeries and it's just a resiliency that just is within you that, or you have to um, foster within yourself 
that I think really makes kids grow up really quickly. I know the answer to this to us, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, did she help you through this? I mean, I'm thinking of her sense of humor. It's, yes. I mean, it's kind of, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. So talk yes. about how she helped you through well, this. Well, she, she, uh, she was so factual about everything. She, somewhere in this book, she, uh, someone called, called and said they're, they're, they were concerned about her condition and the fact she might be dying. And, and she, they began to cry, and she said, What's their problem? <laughs> so, uh, so that helped us because there was there was a certain understanding about life and death, and 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 I think, by the way, some of the things that are being done now are really helpful. For example, Death Cafe discussions, hopefully like this. Uh, there's this author Stephen Jenkinson, who has written the book Die Right. Uh, Google that person. He, he's Die Wise. Die Wise, yeah, well, yeah, that's right, Die Wise. Stephen Jenkinson, a uh, very interesting person who has a retreat in Ontario uh, and, and, and apparently is very popular. Uh, these kinds of things are, are, are helpful to people and, and Stephanie had that certain finality about her. In fact, let me see if I can find it. Um, this is just before she was dying, if I could find it. Uh, the discussion seems to end up the same. Can I ask you a question? What? What do you think is going to happen to you? Or how do you feel about your situation? I guess dying is a plain word. I never asked them what they felt life would be without me. They, uh, they seem to think I should have some idea of what it will be like and tell them. How should I know? I have no idea, more idea than anyone else who has heard the tunnel and light stories. And so that was her attitude, and, and so she was so frank and upfront about it that I think it gave us comfort mm -hmm. that she was able to handle it in that way. I want to also talk about the story of your, I'll get you one second, about your niece. You have a, you have a niece who also had cancer, and you encouraged her not to read the book. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, that's right. I, I, uh, here, here's the family situation. I'm the youngest of our family, and, and I got married a little bit later. Uh, and. So uh, Stephanie never really got to know her older cousins. They were quite, quite a bit older than she was. They all live in Western Canada. We would go out there regularly uh, until, she was, until she got set cancer the second time. And then, and then we concentrated on other things like U2 in London and Hawaii. Uh, uh, so she never got to know her cousins. So I wanted her cousins to get to know her, so I sent sent my siblings all copies of the book so they could give it to their kids. But there's one person that I thought should not have it, and that was uh, a niece who has terminal cancer. And, uh, and so I, told, I said to my sister, I really don't you think you should give it to Dixie. But she did, and here's what Dixie said. I like Stephanie. She was a straight shooter with an irreverent take on life. It is a saga not finished for me as I... As more impressions percolate, I will find myself reading and rereading parts of those passages. So here's a person who has terminal cancer. I don't know how much longer she has to live. And the book actually helped her, which was a surprise to me. So that gave me some level of comfort. Oh, thank you. Um, while reading the book, I loved the balance of the two voices. It, you gave each other equal time. Uh, in, 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 you got to know both individuals separately. Um, I do have to say what a wonderful father you are. Um, I, I put the book down and I said to my husband, oh my God, what a great father. <laughs> I mean, I, I learned about you, most about you as a father and enjoyed that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the role of the social workers? Um, oh. And also, I did want to add before you comment on that, my favorite passage of the book was that Stephanie felt she was good enough, and I think I'm not taking the phrase exactly, but she was good enough to go to heaven. I think I'm good enough. And I, 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 that was about three quarters of the way through the book, and I, I really, that rings every time I think of the title of the book, she was good enough. But I'm interested in, you were very fiercely, 
I think it's the only thing before the horse is you are fiercely protective of Stephanie around social workers. Well, I may have exact. My former wife said uh, she never saw what I saw, but I saw it. Uh, I'll, I'll read one passage here, which is sort of funny. Um, this is one of her experiences with a social worker, and, and I want to emphasize that I don't think this is a universe. Uh, this is the, the exception of the universe. My former wife said she had met wonderful social workers. But here we go. This particular person had hair down to her butt and wore sandals every day. Yes, folks, even in the winter. While still in the torture chamber of Miss Hippie, I made the mistake of looking at my watch. How long has this been going on? I see you are looking at your watch, Stephanie. So, I thought. I see you sitting there. I'm proud of you for nothing, for noticing and being able to verbalize by relaying my actions that are and remain to be none of your business. Are you going somewhere? Yeah, out. What? Nothing. The jerk can't even take a hit. So, <laughs> part of it is that I, I'm not sure that any social worker could have been quite that effective with Stephanie. Uh, now, uh, the, the other question, um, I, I have concluded after uh, there, uh, there's a, a, a faculty person at Falmouth Academy read this book, and she uh, takes care of the, the Falmouth Academy quarterly books called Good uh, uh, Bookworm. And she is going to put, uh, put this book in Bookworm as a recommendation for reading. And she said that she found it heartbreaking and heartwarming. And I think this, that if I were to re rewrite this book, and, and I'm not sure I have one other book in me. In fact, some people say everybody has one book in it. Well, I've, I've done mine. <coughs> but if I were to rework it, I think I'd spend more time on the heartwarming rather than the heartbreaking. I don't think I was a particularly good father. I did, I did, I did, I did what I could. There are a lot of things. I was chasing all over the world thinking that flying first class was a big deal. And, and I, in retrospect, I, I felt like I was caught. I was caught in a conundrum because I was in a board of directors of a company which makes you responsible to the shareholders. You have fiscal responsibility. So I was torn between fiscal responsibility to major shareholders, taking care of my daughter, and all those kinds of things. So I, I don't want to come off as being a particularly great father. But I think that the, the story would be better told if I had spent more time just in some of these quotations that I've read, and it would have brought out more of Stephanie. You know, I, I want to disagree with you, Russ. <laughs> I, 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 I totally disagree, Russ. I, I, I want to say, because I think without the heartbreaking, it isn't heartwarming. Yeah. You have to understand the heartbreak for it to be heartwarming. So I think, I agree, I think the balance is there. Yeah. You want to say no, I, I, I completely agree because you know nobody's their own worse critic than parents right. in, in these situations and it's for the exact same reasons. It's because they're trying to balance life. I mean, there's nothing worse than when I talk to a mother who has worked, you know, or not slept for more than six hours that week and because she's taking care of her, her child and she said, well, I'm not a good mom because of X, Y, and Z. And they focus on the negatives and what they didn't do that week. but and I try to point out everything that they're trying to balance. And not just taking care of other children, but just self-care. You know, well, have you done this for yourself? You know, they're multitasking, paying bills, and taking care of a house. We all know what that's like. So you're doing the best that you can, given the situation. I mean, that's really what it's about. And, you know, if you had a choice, you know, you probably could go back and pick everything mm -hmm. that you did, but you were doing the best you could at the time. It's the old adage. I was going to say that. If you go back, you can go, oh, maybe I could have done it. Isn't that true of anything in life? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, way in the back. How old was she when she started journaling? Well, she, she started journaling about, uh, probably in grade, uh, she was probably 12 or so when she started her journals. Uh, but she got into it big time. After she, be, after her cancer returned when she was 15, and part of the reason, part of that was because she couldn't do sports. She, she couldn't see, and, and later with her legs, she really couldn't run that well. 
Um, so she was, she had to find a different outlet. And writing became that outlet. And so that was one factor. The other factor was that she became actually quite popular at Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. Nurses would come from another floor when they heard that Stephanie was in town. And, uh, and her doctors suggested that she could help others by writing by her notes and writing. And that, that nudged her to begin uh, doing, making notes and, and entries into her diaries on a much more rapid basis. She, she recognized at the last that she wasn't going to be able to write the book, and basically that's one of the major reasons I did it. But she was, she was, uh, she was a very good writer and, and uh, artist from a very early age, I'd say 12 or maybe even earlier than that as far as art is concerned. Was she always honest, like that honest? In her I, I didn't. Was well, she that honest? Yeah, she. He, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was there was no way you could get away from this kid. <laughs> she was her her life was. She seemed to understand that life has a certain span, and her span was shorter than others, and so she was gonna she was gonna get her her shots in when she could. Yes. Somebody else. Somebody else have a? Oh yeah. I have lots of questions. Go ahead. I just want to say I had a foster son who took his own life, and it took me ten years to do a memorial. I just I couldn't do it before then. And you said it took you a long time to write the book, and I people would say, "Why aren't you? Why aren't you?" And I can't. So it was ten years. There's after. a fury time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question. You you had said that the the cancer was hereditary, and I just wondered, and this may be too personal, and you may say so. What decision making you went through to decide to have another child? Your second daughter, six years younger. Is that I think that's good? an excellent question. Yeah, let me just say so, so anybody didn't hear it. Um, that this is sometimes a hereditary disease, and so what went into the decision making process for them to have a second child? The they didn't have DNA. Yeah. 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 This was pre DNA, and. Um, there is a hereditary component to it. I don't know what the split is. I don't remember the exact split, but it could be hereditary, it could be random. And we didn't know which it was. And so um, we took a considerable amount of time. Her younger sister is five years younger than Stephanie. We took a considerable amount of time for two reasons. One was to research it. And uh, so we went back into our family history and as far back as we could on both her mother's side and my side to determine if there was any evidence ever of anybody having eye problems. We had one case that was not, just not associated with this at all. And so in the absence of any better technical information, that's what we did. The second component in waiting was to be sure that we understood what it was that Stephanie was going to need before we had a second child. And then obviously we felt that a, a sister or a brother would be supportive for her. So those are the processes we went through. Not personal at all. Thank you for asking. Yes, ma'am. I love the whole book, but I love the way you empowered her. And I was thinking, you know, the child will find out there's something so seriously wrong, you'd be old and protected and do this and be careful, honey, and all that. I just love the way every page of that book was motor on and, and encouraging you to be yourself. It was incredible. I loved it. Thank you. I would say and, you. And when you're, you're complimenting on, on empowering Stephanie, and this is a time we're going to remember where that wasn't as popular as it is nowadays. So, see, we're being a great dad. Well, thank you. Thank you. I wondered sometimes if I hadn't empowered her too much. <laughs> and her sister, by the way. If I ask another one, this would be at Lindsay. I was thinking about, now that I'm, you know, retirement age, a lot of my mother, who's 85, has said if she gets diagnosed with something, she wants nothing done. She's seen many, many people through surgeries and chemo and just, and their quality of life not improving, and blah, blah, blah. And I wonder, is there any research, and, and I, I do early intervention, and there was a three-year-old who died, a boy I worked with for a year who died at age three with neuroplastoma. And I think about when a child is young, of course you do everything, you know, you, you don't want, you know, experimental everything, and you try everything, and I just wondered if, is there any data on guilt or, you know, hmm. outcomes for if you 
don't do everything for a child, let the disease take its course, I guess, and then people who try everything and go through years and years of living in the hospital and undergoing lots of invasive everything, and I don't know if I'm being clear, but... <laughs> well, from what I'm gathering with, you, with your question is that, um, you know, in terms of the utilization of pediatric hospice, for example, versus adult hospice, it's very, very small. And I, the reason why I personally think is because families really do try everything to, before they get to that piece. I mean, they really have to have a, a three or four different doctors from different teams saying the same thing. There is absolutely no more treatment we can do. And we live in a day and age where there is a lot that can be done. So, you know, maybe years ago there might have been more um, children dying, but I, I do of you know diseases, com medically complex diseases. But now um, <coughs> we can live a lot longer, and it's very rare. I do find that families um, give up, uh -huh. so to speak, um, until the very, very end. And whereas obviously adult populations, it's completely different. You know, and it's obviously personal choice. And you know, people who are well into their 90s, 100, you know, they have a little bit more acceptance, of course. And in terms of um, grieving process, you know, for families who have let their child, you know, go on hospice, they do deal a little bit better with their grief when they know that they've tried everything. Because that's a big piece of it is the, the regret factor. Did we do everything we could? And you know, is there a right or wrong answer to any of this? Absolutely no. So it, it is personal choice. But I want to add one thing to what you're saying, Lindsay, about the hospice experience. I've had it, but I'm not with a child with, with my father. And I think the experience, whether whatever the age is, is really beneficial because you look what do we know? What do I know about death? I don't know the signs of death. And I thought our hospice worker telling us what signs to look for, things that are likely to happen, all of those things were very comforting to at least have some idea of what we may be facing. So I think that what the work hospice workers do is just incredible in, in my mind. I think you guys are all fantastic. But, um, and I just want to say one other thing. When you were talking earlier about how you approach a family who's grieving um, after, whether it's a child or, or an older um, family member that's died, there is a difference when they die suddenly, as you were saying, Russ, and when they die when you have some time. My mother died suddenly. Completely a different, um, you, I remember very little of it because it all happened so fast. When my father had cancer and I had much more time, like you did with Stephanie, a completely different experience. So that's very, very yes. true. Somebody had a hand up. Yes. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, um, tag along with what Lindsay was speaking of earlier about the abundance of resources that we have available and endless uh, uh, treatment options. And I was wondering if uh, Russ wanted to speak to uh, one of the parts of the books that really affected me was when Stephanie said, "Enough is enough," and I have I have done as much as I, you know, I want to do and I'd like to, and you know, just as a family, you're coming to the conclusion of uh, stopping treatment when she was ready. Uh, did everybody hear that question? I guess. I think, yeah, basically she wants to know about the, the decision to stop treatment when well, the woman and Stephanie said enough is enough. That, that's, that, is, that is the conundrum. We went to a, we were in Sloan Kettering, which is a cancer hospital, right? They are in the business of beating cancer. And therefore, it's difficult for them to come to you and say, are you sure it's wise to go on? That never happened. Uh, the opposite happened. Stephanie had decided to give up. I had called a friend in Los Angeles who, who had lost, he and his wife had lost a daughter. I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, I'll call you back in half an hour. He said, let her go. She's asking to be released. While, while we were out, I guess from that, we, maybe we were out getting a cup of, co a cup of coffee, or I had, had finished my call with this person in, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, we came back in, and the doctor had, through I don't know what mechanism, convinced Stephanie to go ahead. If we hadn't, this is what I agonize over, if we hadn't been out there, if we had come back in quickly, she would have had a shorter life, but maybe a higher quality life. 
at the end, I have to tell you, I felt like we were outside of the realm of experimental medicine. We hardly even knew what was going on. I don't blame the doctors, but it, it's a caution to parents to be sure that you understand where you are in that process. In retrospect, if we had gone back in that room and Stephanie had said, I'm out of here, maybe she would have lived another year. I don't know. But she, 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 she got maybe, maybe two, two and a half more years of extremely difficult quality of life. So I think you raise a very important point for which I have no answer. Way in the back, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead. Well, I just want to make a comment sort of to that. Um, and, it, and it's really difficult, but I think listening very carefully to what the children are saying, because they know in their heads, they know themselves what they need. And it's, and it's like, don't get me wrong, as a parent, you do want to do everything and as much as you can, but at some point, you have to listen to when they say with clarity, this is done and I'm okay with it, and you have to be too. And I think that honestly, it's death is a taboo subject in our society, and we all have differing views of what we would want with our own personal wishes, how we would handle these situations. And it's inevitable that that comes up when our loved one, regardless of age, is approaching end of life, of how we want things handled, and it may differ than our loved one. And so, back to your point, you know, it's empowering them. And yes, we will always want to make sure it's not a spontaneous decision or, um, something that's just a fleeting thought, you know, give it some time, but, you know, whether a child is 19 or, you know, 10 or 11, um, listening to them, you know, and what is it that their wishes are? And um, it's very important that we take a look at that and uh, finding that balance in our, in our culture of doing, 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 and empowering people to make their, their choice, their end of life choice. The last question is going right here. My story is very unusual. My daughter was a scientist. She was working on the cancer research. And she got a breast cancer. And she had a theory that she inherited. And she, instead of she concentrated on her illness, she started to do research work back, back to our ancestors who had cancer in my family. We can go back several thousand years, our family. She find out her father came from Transylvania and she find out 11 women died and get cancer in the line of his father line in Transylvania. So I am not able to write about, I am a professional writer, but I can't write about my daughter. But I do the research about how the cancer went through to different people, different part. Usually, the first woman of the certain family get the cancer. My younger daughter doesn't have anything. Her family doesn't have anything. My older daughter was not married for this reason. I would never have the strongness that you have to write about her. Thank you. Never say never. You may say at some point, but it's right. interesting research, and I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing that at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank all of you. Um, this was an amazing panel, wasn't it? And um, 
I just wanted to, the Death Cafe that was mentioned, we have um, one of the co-facilitators here. Heather, did you want to say something about an event coming up? Sure. Yeah. Very briefly. Yeah, thanks. Um, Melissa thought uh, that you might be an audience that would like to know that there is a monthly Death Cafe and Death Education class uh, in Falmouth. And this month will be the beginning of our fifth year that we've been meeting monthly at the First Congregational Church. It's open to everybody. It's not, there's no religious affiliation. It's just the church is providing space. And one of our facilitators is the minister, uh, uh, Jonathan Drury. We have two physicians that are also uh, facilitators and a local therapist and, and uh, um, somebody who does our press releases and somebody else who does our flyers. Anyhow, the next one is a is usually the second Monday of every month, but the next one's actually going to the second Monday is this coming Monday, which is the uh, uh, Columbus Day. So we're doing it the following week, the 16th, and uh, it's in the evening from 6:30 to 7:30 is the Death Cafe, which is just an informal gathering uh, around tables with tea and and often cake. It's part of the international movement of bringing community together to just talk about any aspect of death, dying, and bereavement that people are, it's really group led. So what, whoever comes is, is really what leads the conversation. And then we follow that with an hour of a death education program that varies every month. Uh, Lindsay was here, uh, was presented last month on talking to children about death. Russ is going to be one of our uh, speakers probably sometime in the spring. Um, so we have a different program every month and this month for October we're going to have a film called uh, The Art of Natural Death Care, which is going to be about community and home death care and uh, environmental uh, um, um, uh, options that people might not, not be aware of. So anyhow, thank you. Thank you so much. And also, I just want you to know that um, the Center for Hope and Healing, which is Hope Hospice's grief support program, has a spousal and life partner loss support group right here in Falmouth um, that meets on Wednesdays from 3 to 4.30 um, at our office, which is just down at 359 Main Street. So there's lots of resources in the community. Please stay. We're glad to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Help yourself to coffee, and then Russ, are you going to be available to sign books? I will personally sign books. I want to thank Eight Cousins. They're like a real partner, and uh, the books are available for sale back there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mindy. You're the best. <laughs> Mindy Todd is the best. Yay.